Can you those mic? Good morning, and welcome to the All Souls live stream worship gathering for Sunday, April 12th. We serve as we serve the greater good by remaining physically apart during this time of contagion. We nevertheless come together in mind and spirit through the gifts of technology. My name is Rebecca Gant, and I am the intern minister here at All Souls in Kansas City. Today, I have a special announcement to share with you that I have been called to be the candidate for ministry at the Unitarian Universalist Church in Bloomington Normal, Illinois. That search team and I fell in love on my visit there, and I so look forward to finding out if their congregation will vote to say yes to me. We begin today with some opening words. It's a pr called Prayer for a Pandemic and it's from the Ursuline Sisters of Louisville. On this Easter morning, may those who are merely inconvenienced remember all the ones whose lives are at stake. 
May those who have no risk factors remember the most vulnerable among us. May those folks who have the luxury of working from home remember those who must choose between preserving their health and making their rent. May those who pine for visitors and gatherings remember those healthcare professionals whose work puts them on the front lines every day. May families who have the flexibility to care for their children when schools close remember those who have no options. May travelers who have had to cancel trips remember the people who have no safe place to go. And may those who are losing money in the tumult of the economic market remember the newly jobless, those who have no security at all. As fear grips our country, let us choose love. On this Easter morning, when we cannot physically wrap our arms around each other, let us find ways to be the holy embrace of love to our neighbors. Amen. We'll begin worship as we do every Sunday by lighting the flame of a chalice. As we kindle the light of this chalice, may each of us know that we are not alone. If you have a chalice or a candle at home, I invite you to join with me. As you light that flame where you are, please scroll down to the bottom of your screen and you may see a comment button. Once you see it, you may type in where you are, where you are lighting your chalice this morning. Maybe something like, the chalice is lighted in Independence, or the chalice is lighted in Overland Park, or at 95th and Warnell, or at Oak Hall. We'll pause for a minute to watch where else the chalice is lit as I light my chalice here in Lawrence, Kansas. Good morning and happy Easter. Welcome once again to our friends from the Warrensville UU congregation and congratulations on your candidacy, Rebecca. Now I invite us to continue our virtual connection by speaking once again the words of our community's covenant promise. Together we affirm goodwill is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Our first hymn is a lovely but less familiar tribute to spring. You will hear the section leaders to help you along. You may be interested to know that one of the several challenges that we confront as Anthony and I work to put together these online services is that we do not have permission from the copyright holders to broadcast and record some of our favorite songs from the UU hymnals. Like many other aspects of this quarantine time, this is a learning opportunity to expand our repertoire. Also, did you know that the tradition of the Easter rabbit is much older than the story of Jesus? 
After the hymn, Joseph Davis will relate a story from the Buddhist tradition about why many Asian cultures say that you can see the image of a rabbit or a hare in the full moon. And then I'll be back with the first reflection about Easter magic. My friends, my church, my beloved community, I am Joseph Davis, and I am going to read the story of the selfless hare. The Jakarta tales are part of the Pali canon of Buddhist scripture, and in each of them, the person who would become the Buddha is reborn as a different character and teaches a moral lesson. Many of them are retellings of the older folk traditions in the Buddhist context. So, long ago, the Buddha was once reborn as a hare. He lived in a leafy forest among soft, tender grass and delicate ferns, surrounded by climbing vines and sweet, wild orchids. The forest was rich with fruits and bordered by a great river, the Buddha hare had three animal friends, a monkey, a fox, and an otter. Together, they tried to keep the laws of right and wrong, observe the holy days, and be generous to all those in need. One day, the four friends separated to find food. The otter caught seven red fish on a river bank. The fox found a lizard and some yogurt. The monkey gathered mangoes from the trees. One of the great gods, Sakra, wanted to learn about kindness, so he took the form of a wandering priest. And he went to the otter and he said, Friend, I am hungry. Can you help me? And the otter offered the stranger all seven of the fish he had gathered for his own supper. Then the priest went to the monkey and said, Friend, I am hungry. I need food. Can you help me? And the monkey offered him all the juicy mangoes he had looked forward to eating himself. Then the stranger came to the hare and asked for food. But the hare had no food to offer except the lush grass growing in the forest, which a human could not eat. So he told the old priest to build a fire 
And when the fire was burning, he said, I am willing to give you myself to eat, but I cannot speak for the fleas on me. Then, after carefully picking off all of his fleas, the hare threw himself into the fire to cook. The god Sakra, still disguised as a wandering priest, was astonished at the ex example of generosity. He caused the fire to go instantly cold so that the hair was not burned, and then revealed his true form to his selfless creature. Dear hair, he said, your virtue and kindness will be remembered through the ages. Some say Sakra then took the hair to live forever on the moon. Others say Sakra painted the kind hair's likeness on the pale face of the moon for all to see and remember, while the four friends lived long and happily together in the beautiful forest. But to this day, those who look up at the full moon can still see the image of the selfless hair. Hares and rabbits are not the same animal, but they certainly look similar. One difference is that hares bear their young in grass nests on the ground rather than underground burrows like rabbits. Because baby hares are born completely developed, fully furred and with their eyes open, they do not remain in their nests, which are called forms, for very long. It is not uncommon for a disused form that once held a hare family in the spring to be adopted as a nest by ground-dwelling birds like plovers. This may be the origin of the idea that the Easter bunny brings eggs. While rabbits are more suitable for domestication and household pets, the hare has many associations with ancient springtime magic. Some traditions picture a hare as the companion animal to Estra, the pagan goddess of dawn and springtime. Sometimes the goddess carries the sun and the hare brings the moon. Hares were once thought to have magical abilities. They were said to be the only animal that will run into fire in order to escape human pursuit. You can hear echoes of that in the Jataka tale of the selfless hare. They were also thought to be able to change from one gender to the other, or to give birth spontaneously without mating. Many medieval paintings of Mary the mother of Jesus show her with a pure white hair at her feet, suggesting that she too was fertile although virginal. Hares are solitary and nocturnal most of the year, but in early spring their high-energy open-air courtship behaviors of running and jumping erratically and chasing and boxing with each other have given rise to the expressions hare-brained and mad as a March hare. Hares have also been symbols of transformation in many cultures. In British witchcraft, the difficulty of catching or even following a running hare who can move at a sustained 35 miles an hour, zigzagging over long distances, gave rise to the idea that female witches would elude detection by turning themselves into hares. There is an image found all over the ancient world of three hares chasing each other in a circle whose ears meet in the center, forming a triangle. Each hare appears to have two long ears, and yet there are only three ears depicted. This motif is repeated in Buddhist caves and Chinese textiles, on Muslim Persian coins, in German Jewish synagogues, and in many 14th and 15th century Christian churches in Cornwall and Devonshire, England, where it was explained as a reference to the Trinity. This motif was also often associated with the tin producers' guilds 
and with alchemy, since the mining and refining of tin is a complicated and mysterious process to the uninitiated. The elusive hare, with their exuberant mating antics, is the harbinger of spring's transformations. Gazing down from the full moon, they observe the alchemy of winter's end and the beginning of the new growing season. They companion the goddess of spring as she wakes the plants and animals from dormancy and brings new life. More than just a chocolate bunny with a fancy basket of jelly beans, the hare beckons us to a bit of earth madness at Easter time in the new green after the long cold. A long tradition here at All Souls has been our annual children's Easter egg hunt around the grounds. Andrea, Angie, and Chuck have come up with some pictures from years past, and in the corner is the number of eggs that you might be able to find in each picture if you have a good eye. It's a bit damp after last night's storm for being outside anyway, so enjoy this virtual search. Kendall invited me to say a few words this morning about what my work on the grounds and the building means to me and why it matters for all of us to continue to support our church. As soon as I became a member, some 37 years ago, I knew I should make myself useful. Over the years, I've worn many hats and taken on numerous projects. Some have presented a rather steep learning curve. Groundskeeping, however, began early when my father put a hoe in my hand in 1946. Thus, working in the garden, my toes in the dirt, the smell of the earth, I'm six years old still, my whole life before me. 
something like a second childhood. But there's a mission in it too now, partly expressed by the poem, The, Ser the Serendipitous Garden. Pretty ordinary from a distance, or maybe not. Maybe you're not so striking or eye-catching, but regardless, as you get closer, when you get into it, you see things here and there unseen from a distance that surprise and delight, and you make you wonder, what is that? And make you wonder. Over time, my main gardening objectives have become healthy practices and habitat restoration. Why? My understanding is that we, humankind, are rapidly destroying our planet, our home. We must stop this. Some time ago, in a dark moment, I wrote, the only hope for the planet and all its wonders is our own extinction. Let us hope not. But this is why Earth Day matters, why we must learn to do things differently. That may also prove to be more enjoyable, rewarding, and self-fulfilling. My mission here, for myself and for all souls, is to set a good example, to let our grounds demonstrate healthier, better choices for the future. My efforts are also my way of thanking our members who are engaged in the community in important tasks and challenges. They do work I know is important and necessary, but that I myself don't have the courage to do or can never do as well. Angela Howard, Mark Gibbons, Evelyn Maddox, Beth Anders, Dave Yeckel, all of the Green Sanctuary, PeaceWorks, and Forum folks. Thus, for me, in many ways, this is, an, this, this is an important place. Important, necessary work happens here. And that, most of all, is why I support this church, our church, and invite and encourage you to do the same. The offering shall now be given and received. Let's say together the words of dedication for our offering. We dedicate our offerings and our actions to the mission at the heart of this congregation, to build a respectful, caring community, to inspire personal and spiritual growth, and to create change toward a just and compassionate society. Good morning. This reading is from the Reverend Maria Swearingen. She co-pastors the historic Calvary Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. with her partner. Easter does not exist to make an empire look better or shinier or healthier or stronger. Easter's not the day we brighten our doors and our organs and our trumpets and our sermon manuscripts just to display the well-being of systems of domination, 
hoarding inequity? No. Easter happened in the quiet in the morning. The only thing it demonstrated was that the empire did not have the last word, that the empire could not ultimately destroy people for its own sake, that the empire could not, in the end, consume people for its own gain, and the empire could not violate people for its own perpetuity. So, yeah, I'll take a hard pass when it comes to treating Easter like a tool of the empire like a day we're supposed to make everything look like it's back to normal, business as usual. How about you? You had not imagined that something so empty could fill you to overflowing. And now you carry the knowledge like an awful treasure or like a child that curls itself within your heart. How the emptiness will bear forth a new world you cannot fathom, but on whose edge you stand. So why do you linger? You have seen, and so you are already blessed. You have seen, and so you are the blessing. There is no other word you need. There is simply to go and tell. There is simply to begin. American politics contains this interesting piece of threshold time. Every four or eight years, there's a period of some 10 or 11 weeks in between election day and the inauguration of a new president. Everyone knows who the new leader will be, the decision has been made, but they are not in power yet. The previous administration is about to end but is technically still in charge for the moment. It is helpful, I think, to imagine that the communities of Jesus and his disciples and the early Christians saw themselves as living in just this kind of time. The redemption of humanity had already been decided. It was a done deal. And yet, for just a little while yet, the powers of earthly empire still held sway. It's always a balancing act. How much do you conduct yourself as you know the new powers that will be would want you to do? And how much do you pay heed to those who are still running the show, even though their days are numbered? Paul's New Testament letters to the newly founded churches throughout the Gentile Roman Empire are so much easier to understand from this perspective. Live into the kingdom that God is in the process of establishing, he urges his followers. It is the only reality that is going to matter going forward. But don't be surprised if the outgoing empire can sometimes still jump up and bite you. And the real challenge is that the old empire and the new kingdom both exist within you as well as all around you. The old policies are familiar and comfortable even if you don't approve of them. And the new regulations are going to feel awkward and complicated, even if you agree that they are better. We ourselves are living in a kind of liminal threshold time out of time, in some way holding our collective breath, waiting for the coronavirus to lose its hold over us, as we are confident that one day it will. We will manufacture more masks, create more test kits, find a vaccine sooner or later. Of course we will. We know how to do this science thing. It just takes a little time. But in that meantime, so much risk, so much suffering, so much grief. Easter is not about the celebration of empire, that is for sure. Those who make it a shiny, flowery triumph do not understand its true power. 
its vision of a future that is both now and not yet, its call to live in the ambiguous land between ultimate assurance and present threat. Jesus spent all his ministry there, summoning the oppressed and impoverished and despised to sit down at the victory feast of a struggle already won, to be shared in the shadow of a power not ready to concede its own defeat. The threshold of a new world is no comfortable spot, not a place to relax or be at ease, but it is where we have arrived at this moment in history. Jan Richardson says, you have seen, and so you are already blessed. You have been seen, and so you are the blessing. There is no other word you need. There is simply to go and tell. There is simply to begin. May we not despise the lesson of Easter, the summoning to live into a future that is both now and not yet, the home that our spirits yearn for where they have never been. For that is the only resurrection that matters. I'd like to begin this final segment 
with some wise words from Aisha Ahmad, assistant professor of political science at the University of Toronto, in a blog post she entitled, What to Expect. She writes, among my colleagues and friends, I have observed a common response to the continuing COVID-19 crisis. They are fighting valiantly for a sense of normalcy, hustling to move work online, maintaining schedules, creating schools at their kitchen tables. They hope to buckle down for a short stint until things get back to normal. The answer to the question everyone is asking, when will this be over, is simple and obvious, yet terribly hard to accept. The answer is never. Global catastrophes change the world, she goes on, and this pandemic is very much akin to a major war. Even if we contain the COVID-19 crisis within a few months, the legacy of this pandemic will live with us for years, perhaps decades to come. It will change the way we move, build, learn, and connect. There is simply no way our lives will resume as if this had never happened. And so, while it may feel good in the moment, it is foolish to dive into a frenzy of activity and productivity right now. That is denial and delusion. The emotionally and spiritually sane response is to prepare to be forever changed. It is perfectly normal and appropriate to feel bad and lost during this initial transition. Consider it a good thing that you are not in denial and that you are allowing yourself to work through the anxiety. No sane person feels good during a global disaster, so be grateful for the discomfort of your sanity. Given time, your brain can and will reset to new crisis conditions, and your ability to do higher level thinking and planning will resume. Now more than ever, we must abandon the performative and embrace the authentic. These essential mental shifts require humility and patience. Focus on real internal change. These human transformations will be honest, raw, ugly, hopeful, frustrated, beautiful, and divine. And they will be slower than most of us are used to. Be slow. Let this distract you. Let it change how you think and how you see the world. Because the world is our work. And so may this tragedy tear down our faulty assumptions and give us the courage of bold new ideas. On the other side of this shift, your wonderful, creative, resilient brain will be waiting for you. Things will start to feel more natural. Understand that this is a marathon. If you sprint at the beginning, you will vomit on your shoes by the end of the month. Emotionally prepare for this crisis to continue for 12 to 18 months, followed by a slow recovery. If it ends sooner, be pleasantly surprised. None of us knows how long this crisis will last. The uncertainty is driving us all mad. Of course, there will be a day when the pandemic is over. We will hug our neighbors and our friends. We will return to our classrooms and offices and coffee shops. Our borders will eventually reopen to freer movement. Our economies will one day recover from the forthcoming recession. Yet we are now just at the beginning of that journey. For most people, our minds have not come to terms with the fact that the world has already changed. On the other side of this journey of acceptance are hope and resilience. We will know that we can do this, even if our struggles continue for years. We will be creative and responsive, and will find light in all the nooks and crannies. We will learn new recipes and make unusual friends. We will have projects we cannot imagine today, 
and will inspire people we have not yet met. And we will help each other. No matter what happens next, together we will be blessed and ready to serve. Now here's the thing. The essence of Easter is transformation. It is never about things going back to the way they were before. The new life of spring is new. It's not last year's leaves. Those are over and done. Even the empty tomb of the Gospels is not a sign that Jesus and his entourage are going to resume their former life. In fact, that way of things is finished. It is only a radically new understanding of how to be a community together that can save them from dissolution and despair. This Easter, as never before in many of our lifetimes, we are invited to seek the strength to let go of an old way of life and discover what else might be possible. As the poet Edna St. Vincent Millay wrote at the end of the Second World War, fear not the tolling of the solemn bell. It does not prophesy and it cannot foretell. It only can record and it records today the passing of a most uncivil age, which had its elegance, but lived too well and far, oh, far too long and which on history's page will be found guilty of injustice and grave wrong. The sane and real thing to do right now, as Aisha Ahmad says, is to be grief-stricken and afraid, knowing that the world will never be the same. Easter morning was like that for Jesus' disciples. It would take years and decades for them to work out what the reality of the empty tomb would actually mean for them personally, for the world, for the future. At first, the rolled back stone and the missing body was just one more indignity, one more complication, one more heartbreak to deal with. Had their beloved leader's corpse been mistreated? savaged by animals, disposed of as part of a cover-up by the Roman or Jewish authorities. Amidst all their other disappointment and grief, were they not to have even the simple comfort and closure of seeing him properly buried? The world as they had known it, transformed by the possibilities of healing, justice, grace, and freedom, blessed by God's loving compassion, evaporated as their teacher gasped out his last breath on the cross. Nothing of his bright vision remained, only the memory of betrayal and suffering and death. The Roman Empire, too, was a most uncivil age, which had its elegance, but lived too well and far, oh, far too long, and which on history's page would be found guilty of injustice and grave wrong. And yet it is in the confusion and anguish of that disappearance, that inexplicably empty tomb, that the first whisper begins on the lips of the broken-hearted women trembling at their own audacity. Risen? What if the story isn't actually over? What if the message still lives within us, is made real by who we are together? What if the vision he taught us is still as true as it ever was? What if he is still among us, instructing, encouraging, calling us to rise again? What if we too, on this Easter morning of coronavirus danger and death, are called to rise again and make a new world? What if there is no way back to what was before, only a path forward 
to a different way of being, perhaps a society more nearly what it and we ought to be. This isn't the first time the world has fallen apart. It just seems more devastating because it is ours. It seems and is more global because we know we are a global people. Ironically, what will save Sweden or Singapore or Peru or Kansas City is not pretending that there is a wall or a fence or any barrier that can protect us from our shared human condition. But here is the Alleluia part. Just as the thing that steals the breath of life from us and those we love is worldwide and knows no borders, so too we must survive and rise again together. This is what the forces of the empire never understand, from the days of Rome to the days of Trump. Every one of us matters. What we choose to do how we share and cooperate and protect each other, how we offer our skill and knowledge to the common good. This is what will turn back the tide and save us all. This is how we rebuild the world. This is how we rise again. Not because God likes us best. If there was ever a time to send that dangerous fantasy to history's trash can, it is now. But rather because at the crucial moment we glimpse again the truth that we are in this together, even in this time of isolation, when what is essential is that we cooperate intensely for our mutual well-being by staying apart. No one with a heart and a conscience is coming out of this event unscathed. We will all lose friends, neighbors, cherished elders, loved ones. We will all suffer. Some among us will perish needlessly from the carelessness of others. The world as we knew it is finished. To feel sad and lost and anxious is the sane response. Be not ashamed to mourn and to lament. That is how Easter always begins. Danger and recklessness and cruelty are real and cannot be denied. But hear the whisper. God only knows where it comes from, somewhere deep and always surprising. Rise again. Let your trembling, mystified lips form the words before you even understand what they might mean. Rise again. Throw your ascent and your treasure and your labor to the call when it comes. Rise again. That is all that faith means, has ever meant. That human willingness to rebuild the shattered world and knowing what we know now do better this time. Spring is the sign and the promise. Rise again. The rest is up to us. She went down last October in a pouring, driving rain. The skipper, he'd been drinking, and the mate, he felt no pain. Too close to Three Mile Rock, and she was dealt her mortal blow. And the Mary Ellen Carter settled low. There was just us five aboard her when she finally was awash. We worked like hell to save her, all heedless of the cost. And the groan she gave as she went down, it caused us to proclaim that the Mary Ellen Carter would rise again. Well, the owners wrote her off 
Not a nickel would they spend. She gave twenty years of service, boys, then met her sorry end. But insurance paid the loss to us, so let her rest below. Then they laughed at us and said we had to go. But we talked of her all winter, some days around the clock. She's worth a quarter million a-floating at the dock. And with every jar that hit the bar, we swore we would remain and make the Mary Ellen Carter rise again. Rise again, rise again. That her name not be lost to the knowledge of men. All those who loved her best and were with her till the end will make the Mary Ellen Carter rise again. All spring now we've been with her on a barge lent by a friend. Three dives a day in hard hat suit and twice I've had the bends. Thank God it's only 60 feet and the currents here are slow or I'd never have the strength to go below. But we patched her rents, stopped her vents, dog hatch and portholes down, put cables to her fore and aft and girded her around. Tomorrow noon we hit the air and then take up the strain and make the Mary Ellen Carter rise again. Rise again, rise again, that her name not be lost to the knowledge of men. All those who love her best and were with her till the end will make the Mary Ellen Carter rise again. We couldn't leave her there, you see, to crumble into scale. She'd saved our lives so many times, living through the gale. And the laughing drunken rats who left her to a sorry grave, they won't be laughing in another day. And you to whom adversity has dealt the final blow, with smiling bastards lying to you everywhere you go, Turn to and put out all your strength of arm and heart and brain and like the Mary Ellen Carter rise again rise again rise again though your heart it be broken or life about to end no matter what you've lost be it a home a love a friend like the Mary Ellen Carter rise again Rise again, rise again. Though your heart it be broken or life about to end, no matter what you've lost, be it a home, a love, a friend, like the Mary Ellen Carter, rise again. On this Easter day, may a touch of spring madness and earth magic be with you. May the memory of one teacher's love and sacrifice encourage us to live in the now and the not yet of a new life in which together we shall rise again. We extinguish these flames, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fires of commitment, for these we carry in our minds and hearts until the time shall come when we will be together again. Let's lift our voices in song.
Thank you to our dedicated technology crew for making this service possible, and thank you for joining us this morning. Be with us next week when Dr. Ali Katuz will offer some controversial insights about the leadership of women in the early Christian community, and we will share joys and concerns with the community. Now, please join us for Social Hour by following the directions on the screen or on our All Souls website. May you all be safe and well this week.